Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Thanks to our mysterious patrons, we passed another Patreon support goal. Thank you, patrons! Yay! As a reward, we're listening to The Indestructible Mike Matter, a five-part serial from yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In a departure from our usual recording process, all three of us are listening to this story for the first time. Not only that, we're listening to it together and recording our thoughts immediately after hearing each each episode. In this way, you'll get our real-time reactions to the story's cliffhangers, plot twists, and final resolution. What's more, we're releasing episodes daily, allowing you to enjoy the story in its original, serialized format. So now let's listen to part three of the indestructible mic matter from yours truly, Johnny Dollar, first aired June 6th, 1956. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music and listen to the voices. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Huh? What? You're John Wesley Cosgrave, aren't you? That's right. Well, my name's Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, of course. I've been expecting a call from you. Or at least from somebody like you. What's that supposed to mean? I expect you're interested in why I've insured the life of a Bowery bum for $50,000. You bet I am. I want to see you. Why not? Any time. Only it won't do you any good. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York, New York, to the Lakeside Life and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the indestructible Mike matter. Expense account item nine, ten cents. The phone call to John Wesley Cosgrave from my dingy little hotel on the Lower East Side. Item ten, two seventy. Taxi uptown to see Sergeant Randy Singer, Detective Division, 18th Precinct. You get back to that Glad Hand rescue mission in time? After all, when the lab boys discovered that so-called whiskey was almost pure wood... By the time I got there, Randy, the poor old coot had drunk nearly half the bottle. Oh, that's too bad. Well, I better arrange for him to be hauled down to the morgue. Uh Uh-uh. Old Mike's still alive? And happy. Oh, that's impossible. You don't know the half of it. A week or so ago, somebody stabbed him with an ice pick just below the heart. Result? He said the scar itched a little bit. Two days ago, somebody drove a couple of 38 slugs through him. He said it gave him a slight twitch in his side for a few hours. Johnny, come on now. Now he goes and drinks nearly half a bottle of wood alcohol. Poison. Result? A bit of a headache. Indestructible Mike. Indestructible Mike. Where is he now? Locked up in my room at the Brakeley Hotel with orders to eat the groceries I picked up for him and to let nobody in. Good, good. But whoever's trying to get him isn't going to give up. Hey, did you dig up anything on the beneficiary of his $50,000 life policy, Cosgrave? Only enough to scare you to death. Listen to this. John Wesley Cosgrave, formerly known as John W. Gordon, John Dutchie Gordon. What? Alias Skippy Grant, alias Dutchie Smith. Wait a minute. Eighteen arrests was only one conviction back in 1938 for possession of narcotics. Randy. Ever hear of Murder Incorporated? Sure, but... Apparently they had a subsidiary. Apparently your friend Gordon or Cosgrave or whatever you like to call him was one of the big shots in it. But outside of the narcotics bit, the department was never able to really pin anything on him. But this guy's address is... Here, let me see. 621 East 49th Street. Yeah. That's not only a respectable neighborhood, but pretty plush. That's right. Well, 
How recent is his record? What's he doing now? Last pickup was in 1944. Numbers game and bookmaking. Charges dropped for lack of evidence. Then, apart from the record, is he still in the rackets? He is. Nobody can prove it. Like in the old days, he masterminded and let somebody else do the dirty work. It's listed here as a, quote, retired, unquote. Well, my money says he's still in business. Well, if you can prove it, the department and the DA's office will love you dearly. But I don't think you will. Every time we dragged in a stoolie who could give us what we wanted, something happened to him. Like what? Jump bail. Well, you should have known better than to let him have bail. One of them poisoned in his cell in the tombs. One breakout. His body was found in the East River. Even one suicide. Like to bet I can't tie him in with these attempts on Mike Flynn's life? Well, now, that's something else again. Uh, maybe it's uh, something we should have. No, no, hands off, and I mean All it. All right, I don't get testy about it, John. I like the old guy, and anybody who tries to hurt him has to answer to me. And somebody's tried. <laughs> Expense account item 11, 165. Cab fare to the Smart Modern Apartment Building at 621 East 49th, where the doorman announced that... Mr. J. Wesley Cosgrave was expecting me and to take the elevator to apartment 11B. Come in, Mr. Dollar. The apartment was expensively but tastefully furnished with overall carpeting that fell an inch and a half thick. Several original oils by famous contemporary artists hung on the walls. But it was the man himself who really seemed out of character with the rundown Randy had given me. He was 6'1 or 2, built like a man who spends his odd hours in the gym. Quick, gray eyes, his hair slightly gray at the temples. And his tailor was a master. Do you like it, Mr. Dollar? Uh, what? Well, that is a genuine Picasso you're looking at. And I consider myself very fortunate to possess this original by Salvatore Dali. Mm. Oh, and I'm sure you'll appreciate the excellent view of the city from these corner windows. Yeah. I must have the best, Mr. Dollar. Only the best. Oh, sit down, please. May I pour you a drink? No. No, thanks. I suppose you're wondering why I decided to buy old Michael Flynn the life insurance policy of which he's so proud. I am. Well, it's really very easy to explain. You see, I was born and brought up on the Lower East Side, Mr. Dollar, in deplorably poor circumstances. My early life was a never-ending struggle for survival and for whatever questionable sort of education I could glean from those about me, many of them criminals, who were my only companions. That's all very touching, Mr. Cosgrave. And I'm afraid I did little to lift myself out of the gutter until one winter night, hungry and broke, I wandered into the Helping Hand Rescue Mission. Yeah, I understand you still go around there now and then. Oh, yes, I do, in the hope that somehow I can help the poor unfortunates there the way the mission and Daddy Bill helped me repay some of the debt I feel I owe. Is that the only reason? What do you mean, is that the only reason? You've given jobs to some of those poor unfortunates from time to time, haven't you? Yes, yes, I have. What kind of jobs? What business? That's hardly a concern of yours, Mr. Dollar. I've contributed much to the mission. I've tried to make life easier for some of the deserving habituaries of the mission. The... What? It's the least I can do after so much was done for me. In the case of Mike, why, his greatest desire in life was to be the proud owner of life insurance. Why, I don't know. I do because you sold him on it. That's a lie. That's a dirty... Is it? Then why make him name you as beneficiary instead of the mission of some other deserving cause? <sighs> that, Mr. Dowler, was his own idea. And since it made him happy, I didn't protest. I suppose the real reason for this particular desire was his feeling that it might give him dignity. Yeah, might... yeah, yeah. Now tell me something. Where does all your money come from, Dutchie? Dutch... Who told you that? Nobody calls me Dutchy no more, not you or nobody else. Them days are over. I'm respectable, even educated. I wonder. Look at my record. I haven't been on the blonde since 44, and that was a bum. Mr. Dollar, I make no pretensions about not having a past. During Prohibition and later, I made millions. Yes, millions in rum running, in the policy racket, as a betting commissioner. How about narcotics? Sure, there was hardly a caper in this town I didn't have a figure into, and I was smart. I pocketed the profits, not my boys. That's why I can afford to be retired and live decent. And I'm going to keep on living this way. You were lucky some of those boys, that mob of yours, didn't rat on you. Yeah, but thanks to a couple of convenient rub-outs that uh, I had nothing to do with, you understand. I managed to stay clean with the law. And now you're as pure as the driven snow. <laughs> Dollar, 
If this was the old days, you wouldn't even live long enough to regret what you're implicating, you think. Which makes me dead sure I'm thinking right. I don't know how much money you've got socked away from those old days. I don't care. But from what you've just admitted... To you, Dollar, not to any judge or DA. Right. And I'll never believe that a clever mind like you is smart enough to keep you out of the pen. Oh, she flattery is. won't get you. No. I refuse to believe you could turn down a chance to make a crooked buck. I don't know what kind of jobs you sent out those poor suckers from the mission on, but the fact they never came back makes that look pretty bad. You can't. And along came it. Mike Flynn, poor old alcoholic Mike. Where the talk of insurance came from, I don't know, but it was too good to pass up. Insure his life for fifty thousand bucks, have him name you as beneficiary, give him a few dollars so he could spend his last days in a happy alcoholic haze. Then rub him out and collect the 50 G. Listen, Dollar, if Mike gets knocked off, neither you nor anybody else is going to be able to tab me with it. And one other thing. Yeah, what's that? As a friendly piece of advice, if I was you, I wouldn't even try. Is that a threat? Oh, Mr. Dollar, you've made a miserable host of me. Come, let me pour you a drink. The finest 25-year-old scotch. And we can talk of pleasant things. For some reason or other, I did have the drink with him. But he knew what was in the back of my mind, and I'm afraid I knew what was in the back of his. Something along the same line as a couple of convenient rub-outs. Once or twice, his veneer of education slipped, but all in all, he made a fair conversationalist. Finally, I left. And all the way down to the street, I kept wanting to look back to see if I was being followed. Somehow, somewhere, there was a way to get this, Cosgrave. But I could see it would have to be through someone else, someone working for him. And whoever that might be could very well be out to get me first. Or Mike. Item 12295, taxi back to the Brakeley Hotel, where I hoped the old boy was still locked up in my room. He was. Oh, well, Johnny. Man, man, I was beginning to wonder what had happened to you. Oh, hey, 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 hey. What what was the matter with that food I left with you? You hardly touched it. Oh, I had enough. It was kind of dry, though. Kind of dry. There's a container of coffee there. Yes, but coffee just doesn't seem to quench my thirst. You should let me bring the rest of that bottle along. That wood alcohol? Any more of that would have killed you. Oh, gee, I did have a kick, though, didn't I? Oh, I don't know how you lived through it. Well, look, now I want some lunch. And, Mike, I'm going to take you along with me. Oh, that'll be fine. Could I have maybe a little drink, too? If... Oh, sure, you can have one. Oh, that's nice. Good. Of course, the size of the drinks they serve nowadays. Oh, no, just one now. Come on. Oh, that's fine. One will be out. See, oh, there's a lovely saloon just around the corner, you know. Come on. Even sandwiches for those that want them, I understand. Oh, oh, oh on these stairs. Maybe we could just bring a bottle back with us to your room if we are going to come back. Sweet, funny old soul. I love him. And I knew that without me, he'd be a dead one so fast. So far, the attempts on his life had been made by persons unknown. Unless the mission, Daddy Bill. Could Daddy Bill be somehow tied in with Cosgrave's operations? I wondered. I paid the check. That's item 13 to 85. And we started walking to the Glad Hand Rescue Mission along some of the back streets. I wanted time to think it out, if I could think, over the incessant, pleasant yes, chatter. I'm my... really enjoying life now that I have money now and then. Why, sometimes I get on the subway and I just ride all over town all day long. Yeah, yeah, you told me. See, why don't you try that sometime, John? It's really one. See, there's a bar there on the corner. Why don't we just... Oh, no, 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 let's pass that one. John, why do you feel that you have to look after me this way? You morning? know darn well why I... Hey, watch yes. the curve, oh, why I'm looking so after you. It's because somebody's... Mike, oh! Mike, Mike, listen to me. Hey, Can you hear me, Mike? To the... Hey, mister, oh. get a cop, an ambulance. You mean for him or what's left of him? Yes, hurry. Oh, what's the matter with you? Use your eyes, buddy. It's too late. was episode three of yours truly johnny dollar and the indestructible mike matter here on the mysterious old radio listening society podcast once again i'm eric i'm tim and i'm joshua episode three of our five-part series and they did what i asked for yesterday we don't know is Mike alive or not? And that is the definition of a cliffhanger. Nice work. Yes, but it's more powerful because it's the third cliffhanger in a row in which Mike is attacked in some way. So now I actually wonder if he's dead or not. 
Like it's far enough into it now that right. he if could they do be that, dead. If they do that every time, you're you're saying, oh well, maybe they're gonna finally maybe have this him die. Is the destructible Mike Matter. <laughs> this might be it. Which if they I, called it that, that would be a little bit of a giveaway. But I hope they end every single one with a cliffhanger involving the well, we attempted have, murder, including of the last episode. The last episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's and all like, resolved. And they're like, ah, oh, well, <gasps> just, that poor man. You know, they just step over his mangled body at that point. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be fine. Walk it off, Mike. <laughs> Please help me out with the name of the guy at the mission, Daddy. Daddy Bill. Daddy Bill. That's yep. why I'm getting that right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is that a nickname? But, yeah, you know, clearly. Daddy Bill. Because he probably asked them to call him Daddy because he seems creepy and <clears throat> paternal. He makes them refer to each other as brothers. So, And he's the guy giving him, uh, Mike, the money, right? And the booze or not? Dropping that off for him or he's just running the missionary? Booze-wise, he has been trying to get Mike away from the booze. Mm-hmm. Mike has been sneaking the booze in. Right. Because he's Mike. <laughs> okay, so he's the guy we met in episode one. Yes. All right. I Who thought wanted that Johnny was a, to join the choir. See, I thought the guy we met in episode one was a priest or something or a preacher, and the missionary was a, a religious place where you could rehab. Do you get what I'm saying? I think it probably is. They were singing a religious spiritual right. in the choir. Yeah. This is why I got but confused. But it doesn't necessarily he's not... mean he's a priest right. or That's a why I got... pastor. I thought his name would be like Reverend Mo- Bill or something. You know what I mean? Like Reverend Daddy Bill. Yeah, <laughs> if his name was Reverend Daddy Billy, he'd be a pro wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> I found uh, meeting Cosgrave very uh, satisfying. Yeah, that top of the show of right straight into Johnny Dollar here to meet you. Yeah, that was cool. And just Cosgrave immediately going, uh, "Yeah, I'll talk to you, but it won't help you." Just playing his hand just yeah. immediately was a nice touch. It reminds yeah. me of uh, oh, how can I forget the name? Bad guy and it's a wonderful life. Have a good time Potter. in jail. You know, and Potter, yes. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of Potter in him. Yeah, old Skippy Grant. <laughs> <laughs> what did he call him? Dutchy? Dutchy, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I love when Johnny Dollar throws that in his face and his diction drops. That's a nice little touch. He starts mm-hmm. talking like a thug. Yeah. And then gets his you made me polished. a bad host. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we haven't said yet, it's episode three, just how good Bob Bailey is. There's a reason he's considered the definitive yeah. Johnny Dollar, because he can do it all. He can play the befuddled straight man when he's dealing with a bunch of comic characters. He can even, I think, deliver some quips very nicely himself. But then when he needs to get tough and go toe-to-toe with a criminal like in this last episode he, he really captures some of the hard-boiled tough guy stuff too mm-hmm. yeah we yeah, also have not- pausing well, to admire things like the production quality is fantastic <laughs> that theme music i yeah. love the theme music has a, a very 60s television show dun, dun, sound dun, dun, to dun, it. Dun. yeah like Sea Hunter, the Thunderbirds. I don't know. It's just something a good about theme it. song should just make you excited <clears throat> about listening to it or watching it every mm-hmm. time. And that's what it does. Every time I turn on Johnny Dollar, I go, "This is gonna be awesome." Even it's if it's exactly not. <laughs> what Willis Cooper came up with with Quiet Please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that action-packed theme song. <laughs> Quiet Please. <laughs> What if <laughs> you just did the theme song to Nightfall? <laughs> What's also fun is the clever ways they fit the recap in for people who may have just tuned in, like when he's talking to the forensic guy at the oh yeah beginning, or is that the last episode? I can't remember, but he's doing like, a. How's a, that guy? Did he die? Yeah, and the dialogue is still clever and funny. The the idea of Bailey having to somehow explain to this other guy what we already know is that this guy just gets ice picks and bullets and wood alcohol and just doesn't die. Um, So it's presented in a way that's entertaining for those of us who already know it, but is there for anyone who just happened to tune in. It's an interesting thing. Did you find yourself going, why are you having the scotch? Like I would never in that situation take food or liquid from that guy in his office you know they'd like, be so scared to do that i think we're supposed to feel that hesitation for a moment and i think it's a game they're playing johnny dollar there's a pause there was interpreting that as possibly a threat from cosgrove and he decided to play it tough 
right. and take him up on the offer. And then found out he's actually a really great conversationalist. <laughs> I like that beat. Where it seems that that's the moment, though, too, cleverly in the script, where he starts to think there's something wrong with this guy, but maybe he's not the total bad guy in this situation, which leads him to start thinking about Daddy Bill at the end. Do you think there's a possibility that there's a sincerity that he just is doing nice things for this mission and he's a reformed man? I do not. Yeah, I find it hard to believe they've gone this far with this guy and all of his past record. But there has to be more to it. Yes. Yeah. But he's involved in it. What if he's For- not? Bet you five bucks. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but it does, I mean, at the surface, it just seems like I was walking by and found an opportunity to scam this insurance company out of $50,000. And all I have to do is stick to my story and there's nothing you can really do about it. Yeah. I think perhaps his motivation might be more complicated than we realize now. Yeah. But I, I have no idea what that is. the bigger picture that will get him in trouble. But right. I'm telling you, I would listen to well, an they... Indestructible Mike spinoff that was just him. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, it would be a crossover with the Hermit from the Hermit's Cave, and they just sit and drink together. <laughs> oh, God. Wouldn't that <laughs> be something? <laughs> will this kill you? Blam, blam. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> Next, I'll have my dogs tear you to pieces. You feel that? <laughs> nope. You got good dogs. Oh, they didn't mean to tear me to pieces. <laughs> They're just overexcited. Oh, my God. We are writing that. <laughs> uh, Only be funny to a really handful of people. I can't wait for the next episode. All right. Tomorrow. Until then. Uh, back to Bob Bailey. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, somebody's going to have to pay for what's happening here. Yes, that's a promise from yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. (laughs) 